Welcome back to LDR 655, Siena Heights University, the Graduate College and Negotiations Process. I'm John Wallace. In this chapter from our text from Lewicki, Saunders, and Barry, 2011, we're going to talk about negotiation power. But I have to assume that you do understand that power is important and that seeking power in negotiation arises from one of two perceptions. Now, within the framework of a negotiation, the entire process, you will probably feel both ways at different times. Negotiator believes he or she currently has less power than the other party, and the negotiator believes that he or she needs more power than the other power. An actor has power in a given situation, situational power, to the degree that he can satisfy the purposes, goals, desires, or wants that he is attempting to fulfill in that situation. That's the definition of power. Of course, the problem is that power isn't always absolute, and most likely shouldn't be. Coercive power often fails to achieve objectives, winning the hearts and minds, as it were, because it's been coerced. And again, perspectives, power is used to dominate and control the other. We have power over or power that's used to work together with the other. Power with, again, for the greater good. There are a number of power sources. French and Raven identified five major types back in 1959. Expert, reward, coercive, legitimate, and referent. Informational, we're going to talk about here, is data we already have, that we've gathered, researched, and organized, our expert level. Personality sources of power. Power based on position in an organization. Relationship-based sources of power. And contextual sources of power. Informational power is the most common use. It's derived from the negotiator's ability to assemble and organize data to support his or her position, arguments, or desired outcomes from one's own expertise. It's one of the reasons your research writing class was so important and your ability to accumulate, gather, and comprehend, as well as disseminate, information is so important. It's a tool to challenge the other party's position or their desired outcomes, or to undermine the effectiveness of the other party's negotiating arguments. Your use of information is highly important. Within personality, there is psychological, broad orientations within all of us, in particular cognitive, motivational, and moral compasses that guide our behavior and responses. Unless, of course, we're in Congress, and then we don't have any of those. Our cognitive orientation are the ideologies about power, beliefs about society, Unitarian viewpoint that the interests of the individual and society are one. The radical frame of continual clash among social, political, and class interests. And the pluralist frame that believes power is distributed relatively equally among groups, allowing for the continual bargaining and evolving balance of power. The motivational orientation is that there are specific motives to use power. We have a strong need to control and influence others, for instance. Disposition and skills, motivation, and personality. The orientation is to cooperation or competition, one or the other. Are you more likely to seek to gain power over or power with the other party? And the moral orientation, the philosophical orientation to power and its uses, which we'll discuss further in the next chapter on ethics. In the position category of power, there are two major sources in an organization. Legitimate power, which is grounded in the title, duties, responsibilities of a job description and level within an organizational hierarchy. Now, most of you are in leadership positions, so you understand this. And if you're not in a leadership position, then there's somebody over you who is, that gets that legitimate power. It's derived from occupying a particular job, office, or position. Power resides in the title and the responsibilities of the job itself and the legitimacy of the office holder. Legitimate power is, unfortunately, the foundation of our social structure and may be acquired by birth, election, or appointment, or even promotion. Reciprocity is foundational in our society and one of three key norms for most of us. Equity, or the right to compensation, is another, and the other is responsibility to aid others. Though, as of late, legitimate power has been weakened, of course, by scandal, corruption, greed, or in some cases, inaction. Power based on the control of resources associated with that position. People who control resources have the capacity to give them the resources to someone who will do what they want or withhold them or take them away even from someone who doesn't do what they want. You can think of a number of resources, but a quick list would include money, supplies, human capital, time, equipment, critical services, interpersonal support. How about IT? And again, some of those most important resources money, supplies, human capital, 
Time equipment, critical services, interpersonal support, held, withheld, or extended. With relationships, there's goal interdependence, how the parties view their goals. Referent power is based on an appeal to common experiences, common past, common fate, or membership in the same groups. Network power is derived from whatever flows through the particular location in the structure, usually information and resources. Here's a sample hierarchy chart for you, and if you've done some study in organizational design, those of you who haven't may be taking it this fall. There's a lot of gap and white spaces in there. And there's lots of levels at which power can be exerted. Within our organizational networks, power from where we're located in the structure, in particular as opposed to a hierarchy, someone not high in leadership by title can gain power because of their actions and responsibilities. This chart comes right out of your book. The tie strength is an indication of the quality of the relationship. Tie content refers to the resources that pass along from one person to another. Some key concepts in this graphic include centrality. The more central we are in the network across the organization, the more power we will have controlling information. Criticality and relevance, depending on how essential the node is, there may not be a lot of information flowing through, but there's still significant power. Flexibility, how key individuals have the ability to make decisions or control access. Gatekeepers in most organizations are some of the most important people. You don't just pick up the phone and, and call Jeff Fedig, for instance, at Whirlpool. There are maybe more than one gatekeeper in front of him. Visibility, if the work isn't being witnessed, affirmation and rewards become much more difficult to achieve, which doesn't mean that you want to be out blowing your own horn or tooting your own horn all the time. But if you're within the organizational structure and your node is far off and your work is not often noticed, it's going to be hard to get more resources. And coalition, it's entirely possible that we may belong to one or more subgroups, as in a holacracy, holacracy, H-O-L-O-C-R-A-C-Y. Within network relationships, again, just to further the discussion from that last graphic, the tie strength is an indication of the strength or quality of relationships with others. The tie content is the resource that passes along the tie with the other person. The network structure is the overall set of relationships within a social system. Tie strength is an indication of the quality of the relationship. Tie content refers to the resources that pass along. Some key concepts, again, include centrality, criticality and relevance, flexibility, visibility, and coalition. Here's your holacracy graphic, and this comes uh, out of the holacracy folks. Holacracy is a concept that ties back to agile management systems, and again, relates mostly to software development, but is being adopted in organizations globally. And within this graphic, as you can see here, even at the highest level, someone is working down below with the lower level. And at each level of the organization, people are interacting regardless of the hierarchy to make sure that everybody's on the same page and is flexible and adaptable, agile, as it were. Within the network power structure, again, centrality, the more essential we are in the network, the more power. Criticality and relevance, depending on how essential the node is, there may be a lot of information flowing through. Flexibility, how key individuals have the ability to make decisions. Visibility, if it's not being witnessed, hard to get rewards. Coalition, and it's impossible that we may belong to more than one group. On a contextual basis, power is based in the context, situation, or environment in which negotiations take place. Batten, as you should understand by now, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. An alternative deal that a negotiator might pursue if he or she does not come to agreement with the current other party. Culture is involved. Clearly, and if you haven't taken organizational culture, you will. It often contains implicit rules about the use of power within our organizations, and it's not the same in every organization, of course. There are agents, constituencies, external audiences involved, all these parties can become actively involved in pressuring others. Is there more power than you have? Here's the don't list. Never do an all or nothing deal. Don't degrade the other party. If you make someone feel smaller, if you insult them, you're going to put a wall up. One of the reasons if you haven't studied the fact that negative reinforcement generally never works, it doesn't. And, of course, you don't want to overinflate your value either because that will put walls up between you. You do want to build momentum through doing deals in sequence. 
working through piece by piece. You want to use the power of competition to leverage some power, but you want to constrain yourself and not take advantage of the other party. Good information is always a source of power. You want to ask more questions. The more information you can gain, the more they share with you, the more power you'll have. And you have to do what you can to manage the process. So your assignments for this week, as we're, of course, all online, are partially done. You've watched the video. Read Chapter 7. You need to continue journaling and paying attention to how and when and where, what kind of negotiations you have ongoing during your work week or even with family. You have a discussion thread posting on your reference list for your paper. It may not be finalized yet, but you've got to have a start going here so we can see. And, of course, there's a rubric for your paper that tells you how many and what types of references you need to have. And uh, you need to reflect, of course, on the chapters and where you're going and where we've gotten so far so that you can move on to the next step. Hope you're having a great week. I will see you in class next week.